For the next session, I am absolutely delighted to be joined by two of my favorite people. Um, Anthony is a senior program manager on Azure Functions. If you're using SignalR on VS Code, he is responsible for that. Uh, you can blame him uh, or you can thank him. Um, and we're also joined by uh, Mark Duiker. He's a lead Azure consultant at Experian. Um, he's also an Azure MVP. Um, and he's joining us from the Netherlands. Uh, everyone, give a warm welcome in the chat. Um, we want to hear you. We want to see your presence there um, to Anthony and Mark. They're going to be discussing overcoming serverless challenges with durable functions. Over to oh. you both. All right. Thanks, Simona. And thanks for joining us, everyone. So Mark and I are going to talk about durable functions today. And durable functions introduces a whole bunch of new patterns for programming Azure Functions. Um, but I guess before we get into those new patterns, Mark, um, maybe we should talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges that serverless yeah. functions face today that durable mm -hmm. functions help us solve. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, I, so I'm a consultant and I usually go to other clients and to help them with some serverless uh, challenges. And uh, what I usually see is what, that they try to uh, apply the, the patterns that they already know for several years and to apply it to an event-driven and serverless architecture. Uh, and, and that often does not work. Um, for instance, when you're building an, an expense management tool um, that has several functionalities, you need to uh, scan in the receipts, you need to analyze them, you need to do calculations, you need to store them and call out to different APIs. Uh, so how are you translating that to, to serverless? Uh, so I see some people doing putting all that responsibility into just one big function, uh, but then they ran, uh, run into uh, uh, duration uh, limits of, uh, of Azure functions in the consumption plan. So that's definitely not ideal. Um, another approach is that they split up the functionality into several functions. So that's already uh, way better. But then the challenge is um, how do you communicate uh, between those different functions and how you do uh, with, with, with states transfer between those functions? And I think the, one of the biggest challenges is um, what happens uh, when you do a uh, long running processes, uh, for instance, an approval workflow, you need to wait for an approval from a manager and that can take maybe uh, hours or days. I mean, uh, and re regular Azure functions, they don't run for, for hours or days. So uh, yeah, th those were definitely a lot of challenges I see uh, day to day. Yeah, that sounds good. So uh, so now let's, uh, let's jump into some of the patterns that uh, durable functions adds to the way that we can write serverless functions. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. And um, maybe uh, before we do that, um, maybe very briefly what Durable Functions is, um, because Durable Functions allows you to write uh, workflows or orchestrations in code. Uh, so uh, it's fairly natural for developers. Uh, so you don't need to configure or you don't need to use a UI, which is not testable, uh, just plain code. Um, and the very nice thing is that uh, the instance of that workflow or orchestrator is uh, persisted to, uh, to disk. And that allows you to um, yeah, uh, have longer execution time, so you're not limited to the maximum execution time of, uh, of 10 minutes, which is really, really a big win. Um, when you're working with uh, Dribbble functions, you'll notice that you there are several function roles. Uh, so let's start all the way to, to the left. So either you or a system uh, triggers a function, and that could be an um, um, HTTP function or a queue triggered function, it can be anything. And the responsibility of that client function is to create an instance of an orchestrator function. So that's the uh, FO one. And that orchestrator function, that contains your workflow as code. And so in that orchestrator function, there's usually some business logic. I'm first calling out to uh, several activity functions. So, so those are the functions all the way to the right. So I'm first calling activity function one, and then I'm calling function two, and then function three. So there you define the sequence of all of your uh, activities. And what's usually inside those activity functions are um, calls to a database to get some data or to store some data or call out to an external API to, to get some data. So that's very typical for Drupal functions that you have to deal with these different function roles. And yeah, the, the combination of all these roles allows you to really um, apply different application patterns, as you mentioned, uh, Anthony. So let's start with, with this one, the function chaining. Um, so it's, it's the most basic one, and it's, yeah, the one you'll uh, are in, uh, want, want to use uh, straight uh, straight from the bat because you usually want to enforce some communication between functions. So you want to conceptually call uh, first an activity, and then call another activity, and then another activity. Um, but this is not how it actually happens when you use durable functions because 
50 functions don't communicate with one another. Uh, so um, it all goes through the orchestrator. So the orchestrator calls function A1, and then uh, once the A1 is finished, the orchestrator will call function A2, and once that is finished, the orchestrator will call function A3. All right, so like in real life, this would be like, for instance, um, like calling, like maybe like an like an extract, transform, and load kind of process, the like ETL process. We can take data through different parts of a pipeline, and that's what the different functions will do. Exactly. So hey, you uh, you apply this when the order is very important. Uh, if if we take the example of the expense uh, management uh, um, sample again, uh, so first you need to need um, um, get get some some images from your user, you need to process them. So that's to be a second step. Uh, then you're um, combining uh, the, the analyzed data and converting into some numbers. And then as a last step, you're storing it. Uh, so the order is important. Awesome. Uh, let, how about let's talk about another pattern that we can solve with durable functions. Yeah, let's, uh, let's skip the code for now. Um, so another very important and useful one is, um, OK, sometimes the, the, the sequence is not important, but you want to do uh, as much of things in, in parallel. So uh, that's what we call the fan out fan in pattern. Uh, so here we start with a activity function one. Uh, so let's say that returns a an array of objects. So let's say it uh, returns 100 objects. Uh, and then for each of the items in that array, we, can, we want to call the other function, fa2. Uh, so that's the fan out part. Um, but then we're not done yet because we want to aggregate over the results over um, uh, these, uh, these function a2s. Uh, and only then we want to continue with function a3. So that's the fan in part again. And usually the fan out part is quite easy, but the fan in part is usually quite difficult. But th that's where durable function really shines because it makes it uh, very super easy to do. Yeah, and then while we find fan out, it sounds like the functions can run across many, many machines in the cloud um, versus you know being confined to a single machine. So you get all exactly. the compute power that you can get with serverless. Um, hopefully pretty easily. Do you have any code to show us? Uh, definitely. There is a small sample here. Um, so this uh, orchestrator function is just a method. Here's a Python sample. And the first activity, which is called, it's a, a function f1. And that returns a work batch. Right? So that contains an array of elements. Uh, the next thing we do is for each of the items in the work batch, for each item B, we prepare another activity call, uh, function f2, and we pass it in item B. But we are actually not um, making the call yet. So we only prepare the tasks. So right here in the parallel tasks, that's our collection of all of our tasks we want to execute. Uh, but only in this line here below, uh, we are actually performing the fan out and fan in part. So only uh, once the orchestrator has passed uh, the output line, uh, it has fanned back in again. And we have the results of all of the F2 activities. And we can do some aggregation or some function in, in this case. And then we're going to call function A3. Um, also for demo, shall we, shall we do that? Yeah, let's do a quick demo. OK. Uh, so here's a, a cat or dog uh, image classifier. Uh, so let's give it uh, 100 uh, random images of, uh, of cats and dogs. So that's the um, initial um, uh, function, uh, activity function. And once it has all of those uh, 100 images, uh, it will fan out and it will uh, try to process as many of them uh, in, in parallel as possible. And uh, what we will uh, eventually see is that the uh, images per second here at the top right, uh, that will increase. Uh, so you can actually see uh, the scale out. And then there's also a progress bar. So you, you can see how fast it's going. Yeah, you can see it going, getting faster and faster as it's getting more and more compute. That's pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's almost at three images per second. And it's still increasing. So almost five, six images per second. And then you also see it scale down. So now it's done. So it's pretty fast for 100 images, thanks to the yeah. different functions fan out fan in pattern. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so I guess we have a couple of minutes left. Do you want to just quickly go over uh, some of the other patterns that you that, that we can uh, tackle? Yeah, with? yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Once is uh, very useful. It's called the uh, monitor pattern. So what if you want to uh, monitor for an external uh, state? Uh, and that yeah, might take uh, hours or days. It can take very long, which is uh, with normal as functions, very difficult to do. Um, 
So the concept is this, you have an orchestrator and you call out to an API uh, inside an activity function. Uh, and based on that result from the API, you, you either decide, uh, okay, I'm going to wait a couple of minutes and then call the API again, uh, or you might decide to uh, stop the orchestrator. An example for this could be um, checking a uh, weather API. And uh, if it returns that it's going to rain, you want to send yourself a notification so you can uh, get your laundry inside, for instance. <laughs> It's very important in the Netherlands. I mean, it rains a lot, so. Yeah, yeah same thing here in Vancouver. <laughs> All right, um, I think I've got one more. Yes, the human interaction pattern. Um, that's a very useful one, especially if we uh, go to the sample again of the uh, expense management um, uh, tool again. Uh, so let's say you, you have your um, expense reports, uh, but it needs to be approved by your manager, um, dual functions, uh, can uh, start this orchestrator, but then it will uh, wait for an external event. And uh, the event is then your manager clicks a uh, button or clicks an, a link in an email of, okay, I'm going to approve uh, your expense report. Uh, and based on that event, uh, it continues with the orchestration. And so in case your manager approves, it goes to uh, function A1. And in case he, he will not approve, it will go to uh, function A2. So that's a very nice way to uh, to put in uh, human interaction uh, events into uh, long running operations. Wow, that's really cool. Um, yeah, so hopefully that gives everyone a, a good opportunity to, to kind of understand what durable functions might be capable of and, and you can dive in a little bit more later. Yeah, exactly. And there are even lots and lots more uh, more samples uh, out there. It's just, uh, just scratching the surface, but we've got four, four of them. Um, I have a bit of uh, homework as well for uh, for people if they want to know more about Drupal functions. Uh, and I really advise you to uh, uh, to look at this. Uh, so go to uh, bit.ly slash Drupal homework and uh, you'll see a couple of links there. I will briefly show it. Um, so this is the gist, you'll end up in, the, in this gist. Um, and it contains a, um, a link to a blog post by uh, Mikhail Shilkov, uh, which is a very nice, uh, very readable, very approachable uh, blog post with nice graphics on how Drupal functions work. Uh, then a bit of uh, shameless self-promotion uh, linked to my uh, vlog because I've got quite some videos about uh, uh, Drupal functions. Most of the code samples are in C Sharp, but all of the patterns are yeah, translated across all languages. So that should be fine. Uh, if you want to look at the uh, demo you just saw about the cat dog analysis, it's actually done by Anthony. Uh, so this is the GitHub link uh, to it. And finally, the documentation is really very good. Uh, and it also has a lot of samples in many different languages. So please check all these links out. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Cool. Any questions? <laughs> Hi, all. OK, that was such a great session. Uh, I loved I loved your slides, Mark. Those were really, really awesome. Um, nice. And then there were actually tons of questions in, in the chat, and we appreciate them. And um, I think if both of you, Anthony and Mark, can go into the chat and reply to some of them, that would be really awesome. There were some comments about sure. Mark's T-shirt, as usual. Um, and we want to make up for a couple minutes of time, so I'm going to I'm gonna uh, switch over to the next session. But it was so, so great to have you both, Anthony and Mark. Awesome work, uh, and I'm excited for everything that durable functions can help us uh, achieve with serverless. Uh, so good to see you. Take care. Okay, uh, bye. You can all see that I'm a waiver. I am definitely one of those people. <laughs>